it says it's declined. What? Why are you gonna judge me? You don't know my life. I feel like you're not fully invested in this relationship. Hello? Well, if you have a Bible, will you meet me in Psalm 25? We will read the first five verses. This is week three of our reboot series. Um, before we get into uh, this week, I want to just acknowledge a, uh, a few people. First of all, I uh, want to give a big shout out to all those who listen to us or watch us via podcast, wherever you are. Thank you so much for doing that. Secondly, there are many of you who send uh, encouraging emails and uh, cards and even tag us uh, on social media. On behalf of our uh, teaching team, just want to thank you guys so much uh, for doing that. Also, uh, this year I've decided to get back to a little bit of a tradition that I've been used to uh, growing up in church. Uh, I'm going to pray for us right after I read the text and then I'll pray for us at the end just to kind of book in our time together if that's all right. So I want to try that out uh, this year. So why don't you guys do me a favor, stand, and we're going to read Psalm 25. Verses 1 through 5, you don't have a Bible, we won't leave you hanging. We have the words on the screen for you, you can follow along with us. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be Ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. I want to tag this text this weekend uh, with a theme or a subject back to basics. Back to basics. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much just for who you are. God, we pause right now and ask that you would speak to us. Remove all distractions. Remove anything that would uh, take away our focus. And God, I decrease right now and ask that you would speak through me. And God, prepare our hearts to receive what you have for us this weekend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may take your seats. Before we dissect this psalm, uh, by a man named David, uh, who was the second uh, king of ancient Israel, I would like to introduce you to a man uh, named Zerzane uh, Tadisi. Uh, Zerzane is arguably the most famous name in the East African country, Eritrea. He is a marathoner who won the only uh, medal in the Olympics for Eritrea in uh, 2004. As a matter of fact, no one had ever run in the Olympics before 2004 when uh, Zerzane did it. He uh, has a personal best in the marathon of two hours, 10 minutes, and 41 seconds. Now, I don't know if you know anything about running, but that is fast. Um, but Zerzane is actually known for the fastest ever, two of the fastest ever times in the half marathon. In the documentary Breaking Two, uh, there were a group of scientists who got together and wanted to see if it was possible to actually run the marathon in less than two hours since it has never been done. And it actually seemed crazy to pick Zerzane to be a part of the three people that were participate or the three runners that will participate in this experiment because shaving off 10 minutes of your time uh, when it comes to running a marathon. I mean, that is a monumental uh, task. But when you look at Zerzane's capacity, you can understand why uh, he was chosen. When he runs, his body barely makes any lactate or waste, and he barely breathes hard. So the researchers were asking, 
Well, if this is the case, why hasn't Zerzanay been able to translate this into faster marathon times? As a matter of fact, Zerzanay up until that point had not finished three of the five marathons that he had run. But after carefully uh, examining his physiology, his training methods, and his past history, there emerged a clear hypothesis as to why he had not been able to maximize his potential or his capacity. It was simple. It was fundamental. It was basic. It was a matter of hydration. What they found out is that Zerzanay in the marathons that he had run had not taken one drop of water. So the follow-up question was, how can someone push their body for that long and that hard without water? And I'm sure Zerzanay's uh, muscles and internal organs, if they could have responded to the researchers, they would have said, that's what we've been trying to say. Now, you have to watch Breaking 2 to see how this whole thing ends up. And I can assure you, it will be worth your 55-minute investment, Um, even if you're not into running, which I am not. Uh, But this little two-minute snapshot into Zerzanay's quest doesn't really bring to life a, a new revelation for us because I think most of us are smart enough to know that our body needs hydration that our body uh, needs water. Now, we may not know the science of how much we need or when uh, as we run, but it illuminates uh, two things or highlights two things for us. Number one, everything comes back to basics and fundamentals, no matter what you're doing. And number two, commitment to the basics is key to maximizing your capacity and your potential. Show me a breakdown in fundamentals or the basics, and I will show you compromised performance. Now, maybe the biggest barrier to this point that Zerzanay had come up against uh, to run his absolute fastest was just something basic. And I wonder, as we are no doubt in the season right now, of examining and brainstorming uh, our game plan for 2018, or for some of us who already did that, I'm sure you're implementing strategies for a better year than last year. I just want to know, did that examination include an examination of the basics? Specifically, I'm talking about our spiritual basics or our spiritual disciplines. Pastor Mark asked us a question in week one, and I'm here to confront you again about this question. What daily disciplines do you need to put in place to get where you need to go? As we look at Psalm 25, the author, King David, is, I'm sure, like uh, Zerzane, if, if not greater in terms of recognition, he was the most famous uh, name in his land and beyond because David was known uh, as an exceptional musician. He was also an exceptional uh, and feared warrior. And the stories uh, 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 of his rise uh, to, to, to stardom, I guess you could say, or notoriety from a runt shepherd boy would rival any underdog tale. But yet his explosiveness uh, in his indiscretions would, I would think, rival any nighttime drama like Scandal. (laughs) And the tales of his conquests and his victories probably had little kids in Israel pretending to be him like I would pretend to be the super friends back in the day, Batman, Superman, or The Flash. But these are not really the things, as I study David's life, that fascinate me about him. Despite his success, despite his wealth, his influence, his notoriety, his skills, all of these things, David had an unyielding commitment to spiritual disciplines. And the reason that David maintained this commitment is because he knew that no matter what he did, 
no matter what he accomplished, no matter how great his name was, he would rise and fall based on his discipline of seeking God. That was his baseline. That was his starting point. And it was the thing he kept coming back to over and over again. If you study the life of David and you study the Psalms that he has written, you will see and hear this relentless pursuit of God, this passion for him, no matter what the circumstance was. So over the next few moments, I want to examine this basic blueprint that I believe David lays out for us. Now, I want to do this not because I want to give you some practical methodology for success. That's, that's, that's not the reason why I want to do it. I, I, I don't want to try to help you uh, accomplish your goals and your resolutions this year, although I hope you do that. But my hope is to help establish for some and reinforce for others the right baseline to your spiritual growth, to which everything is connected to. Psalm 25, you ready? All right, just a couple of y'all. That's all right. Let's go. Just as a quick backdrop, uh, historically, we don't really know the specifics behind uh, Psalm 25. We don't really know exactly what's happening uh, in his life. Uh, unlike Psalm 51 that Pastor Mark talked about in week one, where we know that David, uh, you know, he had an affair and, and then he had his homeboy, you know, killed and all that stuff. Like we knew that specifically, but we don't, we don't know what's actually happening uh, here. But I think it is clear as you read the psalm in its entirety that David is concerned about opposition. Uh, he's talking about enemies. He doesn't want to be put to shame. He's talking about protection, refuge. And clearly there is some external opposition that he's trying uh, to overcome. In, in Psalm 51 and in week one, the opposition was actually David. David had gotten himself in that situation. And so he was the, the opposition. And sometimes in our lives, we are the opposition. It's us. It's the decisions that we made. It's the things that we have done to put ourselves in this situation. Other times, like in this particular psalm here or this situation, it's external. It's others. Or maybe there are systems or there are situations that are opposing us. But whatever it is or whichever it is, we look to some strategy to employ to get us over, around, or through. And I think David displays for us very simply what the strategy is in just two verses, verses four and five of the text that we just read. And he asks three things that I want to highlight, and I promise I'm going to get out of your way. David says, show me your ways, teach me your paths, lead me in your truth. These requests tell us that David is not a man of self-sufficiency. Now, let's keep in mind who is making this request. This is, this is one of the greatest men of his time. He has means. He has people at his disposal. He, he, he doesn't have Google, but he has plenty of people he can ask. He, he, he got stuff that he can get done on his behalf. If he needs questions answered, he can get them answered. But even though he has these means and he has these resources at his disposal, David says, God, show me. It tells us that he has a total dependence on God. So first he says, show me your ways. This word ways, this Hebrew word here is mentioned over 700 times in the Old Testament alone. I think it's kind of important. Over 700 times, this particular Hebrew word, ways. And it literally means in Hebrew, a road. So literally, show me the road. David mentions this word four times in this psalm alone. So clearly, he's asking for direction. Now, I have to pause right here, put a quarter in the meter because, uh, you know, it's really interesting when I thought about who David was, where he is in his life, and him asking God to show him 
the road. It's it's fascinating to me because I'm not even on David's level. And I know that that oftentimes this is not how I pray. And this is I know how many of us we don't pray this way because what we are in the habit of doing is giving God direction, not asking him for it. Right. Right. We, We say, God, this is the woman. This is the man. This is the job. This is the house. This is the time right now, God. Will you bless it? We, 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 we give direction to God. And here is David, this, this, this powerful man is, is saying, God, show me the road. Now, as I examine this, I, I think the reason why we pray the way that we pray and we, don't, we, we give God direction instead of asking him for direction is because I, I think now, now we is smart, I know. But 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 I but I think we are smart. We think we're smarter than we really are. Amen. There are two cognitive science uh, researchers, Stephen Sloman and Philip Fernback. They call this the knowledge illusion. Now that's the title of their book, and and this book captures their research based on this thesis. Our concept of what we know is inflated. And they argue that most of us don't even know how everyday things work, like the toilet. But we think we do. Now, listen, nothing illuminates this more for me than raising kids. All of the parents said a collective amen, either out loud or or internally. But now before we go too hard on the kids, let's, let's zoom out a bit. Because as I witness the tantrum of my son, who doesn't understand that puppy dog pals doesn't come on all day, every day, neither do we want to watch that all day, every day. The more and more I see this and I experience this in different ways, I'm reminded that I'm the same way because I want my way and because I think that I know best. So now it's becoming a consistent reboot moment and reminder to me as a father of how God handles or deals with me because I have the same issues. And if the truth be told, I'm not really interested sometimes in asking for direction. I just want him to bless the way I already picked. I already picked that. So just just so just just bless that. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. God is saying through Isaiah, he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways, my ways. As a matter of fact, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. It's the same Hebrew word, same Hebrew word that's in Psalm 25. And this is David saying, God, show me the road. And this is God saying to Isaiah, I, I know the road. I know you, you think you might know, but I know. David is modeling for us a basic discipline, and it's this. How about before you go, just ask for directions? It's a basic discipline. So the question is, what road have you started down that you hadn't asked for directions? You just picked the way and say, God, this is the way I'm going. I hope you're coming with me. (laughs) Is it a relationship, a job, a school, a business I promise you, a few of those I have done and it didn't work out well for me. But the good thing is God knows our tendencies and that's why his mercies are new every single morning. So, So let this be the time that we reboot ourselves and begin the habit of saying, God, show me the way. So number one, David says, show me your ways. Number two, he says, teach me your paths. You know, this interesting, this, this Hebrew word for path is actually very similar to way, but it's related to our way of living. So if you put the two together, David is really saying, uh, God, show me the road and teach me the way to live. Now, maybe on the surface, as I mentioned, this is, you know, kind of crazy for David to ask because of who David is. And I already talked about that. But let's be honest, like none of us really like to be told how to live. I mean, we, you know, I mean, it's the reason why I couldn't wait to go to college, you know, so I can get out and go do my thing. You know, I remember getting into this argument with my mom and, you know, shortly before I was about to go to school. And she's like, I know you can't wait to go to school. And I just want you to know, I can't wait for you to go. I said, well, good. We're on the same page. (laughs) 
the reason this is critical for us to understand is because we live in this, this my thing world. You know, it's, it's all about us. We're going to do our thing. It's my thing culture, you know. And here's the thing. The more we're exposed to that, the more that we believe it's all about us. And if we're not constantly seeking God for the way that we live, here's what happens. We start adopting things from the culture that, that's socially acceptable but not God's best for us. Now, this, this is what we do. We curse those who curse us because they deserve it. Oh, I ain't getting no amens right there. We, we only bless the people who bless us because that's who we like. We, we shame the people who don't agree with us or who don't vote like us. I know it's going to be real quiet right there. <laughs> and then if we're a Christian, we do it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, oh, there we go. I, I, I know I'm talking right. The reason for this is because these decisions and this, this path is in the best interest of our comfort. The same Hebrew word path is the same Hebrew word in Proverbs 3, 6 that my mother taught me. It says, all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path or he will direct your way of living. Um, back in November, we had our mission series and, and um, we featured uh, Casa Chidilagua. And um, for those of you who don't know about uh, Chidilagua, um, it, it's, a, it's a neighborhood in our in Arlandria, uh, an area of, of Alexandria, and they uh, have uh, some programs there where they are supporting these families. And um, the uh, executive director of Casa Chidilagua, um, Danielle Miller, came and, and shared with us. And uh, I was so fascinated by, by, what, what, by what she said. She told us about how, the, how her and two of her friends got to uh, Casa Chidilagua, and they live there. That is their community. Um, and these three white women who are in this, this all, you know, this, this uh, Latino community. And uh, she said, we literally began to pray every Monday that God would show us where to go and where to be. And it, eventually he nudged us and told us that it was, it was Casa, uh, it was Chidilagua, and uh, that was the neighborhood that we were supposed to, to move to. Listen to what she said. With the goal of listening to the stories and the wisdom of our Latino neighbors. Now, given the climate of our world, that's a whole nother message that I can't preach right now. But it was fascinating to me that they moved into this community. Now, the program that they started didn't start to like two or three years later. So they literally were just living in the community. But it, it fascinated to me because that is not the starting point for us. You know, we asking, we asking what's the property value? What the schools look like? What's the crime? You know, what's the commute, the shops? Is it cool? Is it trendy? Does it fit me? Is it cute? You know, what's the neighborhood score? I'm not saying any of those things are bad, but that's the starting point. We get that stuff lined up and we say, okay, God, this is the plan. Bless it. <laughs> Please. <laughs> it, it, it was a reboot moment for me because I realized in that moment that I need to be only where God has planted me. Right. Only where he has planted me. Where have you planted yourself? that you didn't get clarity on first because you were more concerned about your comfort than where God was calling you to. What path do you have in mind right now that you came into this year saying, this is the path I'm, I'm, that's on my mind, that's what I'm exploring, that you're not praying about and you're not holding with an open hand to say, God, if this isn't it, remove it. This is what David is modeling for us when he's saying, God, show me your ways. Teach me your path. Because both of these things are associated with the will of God, which is the safest place for us to be. The third thing that David says, uh, he says, after show me your ways, teach me your paths, he says, lead me in your truth. This word truth the Hebrew word literally means stability. Now, the suggestion by David here is that he knows God is the source of truth, and only that is his stability. And then he adds this little phrase at the end. He says, and teach me. The Hebrew word 
For teach literally means, are y'all ready for this? To discipline. Now, how many of us are praying that prayer? <laughs> Lord, please discipline me. No, that ain't what we're praying. Because that's not the form of blessing we really like, you know? But I love a couple of scriptures related to discipline. It says, who the Lord loves, he disciplines. Proverbs, um, that's Hebrews 12, 6, Proverbs 12, 1. Whoever hates correction is stupid. That's in the Bible. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, in the, it's in the Bible. Listen, the key insight into why David was not only successful, but considered to be a man after God's own heart. It was because he had this willingness to let God discipline him. And he sought it and he appreciated it. He had a capacity for it. Now, you might say, well, what does humility have to do with truth? Well, listen to what David says. If we read down in the psalm, uh, verse 9 of, of Psalm 25, he said, He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. I can't speak for you, but I'm going to speak for me. The lack of humility in my life has created more instability than I can recall. And one of the most common reasons is because sometimes... I just don't ask questions or I don't inquire because I think I know. That's called arrogance, (laughs) pride, self-righteousness. And sooner or later, that stuff slaps you, kicks you, and, you know, it it puts you in positions that you don't want to be in. David goes on to say in Psalm 25, 14, which is actually my verse of the year, he talks about, basically he says, when we enter into this relationship and this pursuit of God, the secrets or the counsel of God, it will be revealed to us when we show reverence to God. That's related to humility. So the stability that we're seeking in our lives has to do with humility. And, the, and when we humble out, God will reveal it to us. So the basic point here is, We can have more stability in our lives, number one, if we realize we don't know. It's called humility. Number two, if we ask more questions, we we seek understanding. And many of us, you know, we think we're living the truth, but really we're living a life of preference and what's comfortable. It might not be true, but it just it it feels right, or this is what I what I think, but it 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 hasn't been tested, isn't tried, isn't it? It isn't true. It, It it it's about what we feel comfortable. In. And it's not stable. And here's the thing. Even if we do know a little bit of the truth, there's still more to be learned. Jesus said in John 16, 13, that the Holy Spirit, he said, listen, after me, the Holy Spirit is available to you to lead you and to guide you into all truth. And here's the thing. It takes humility to be led. So if you're going to get that truth, you got to have humility in order to to experience it. Let me see if I can land this plane in the next few minutes. Um, In the offseason, leading up to uh, training camp in the NFL, um, which is an experience that I've been fortunate enough to have, uh, you know, we would literally go back to basics. Every single year, like this is what the reboot would look like. We would do the drills and we would lift, we would run. You know, we do all these little things, you know, just the non-sexy stuff, you know. Um, Same stuff I was doing when I was seven and eight years old when I first started playing. It was a way to reinforce and and to keep the fundamentals sharp. It was just the commitment to the the mundane. Now, I asked some of uh, my military brothers uh, about basic training because I was thinking, uh, you know, along the same lines as it relates to, you know, my football experience. And, and here's what they said uh, is the purpose of basic training. They said basic training is a common baseline for skills that all soldiers are expected to have. But also it is meant to em- de-emphasize the importance of the individual and emphasize the importance of the team. 
So in other words, you got some basic stuff you got to get right. You, you have to work on. And number two, it ain't all about you. That, that's the whole purpose of it. And what's cool is God in his awesomeness has called us into collaboration with him. That is how we maximize us, who we are and what he's given to us. We don't have the ability to do that on our own. So there has to be a de-emphasizing of us and a re-emphasizing of him. And part of the reason why God sent Jesus was because we needed a reboot. We needed an example of literally the way, the path, and the truth that David is, is talking about. And then Jesus literally says it. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. Then he goes on further in the next chapter of John 15, 5. He says, if you remain in me, I in you, and you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. He repeats the word remain 11 times in the short span of 11 sentences. And it's the same theme that's repeated throughout the New Testament by Jesus and in the epistles. Listen, here's the thing. The spiritual disciplines are not about performance, but perseverance. It's the long game. It's the commitment to the unsexy stuff that you're not going to post on Instagram. When it's hard, when it's frustrating, like that, that's not the stuff that, that, that we're posting about. But here's the thing. God never promises to reward us based on how eloquently we pray, the size of our offering, or the amount of the biblical text that we can quote. That's, that's, that's not how he rewards us. I, I love what he says. He said, just seek me. Just make me the priority. I'll take care of all that other stuff. And then one of my favorite promises, he says, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's just basic. Diligently seek me. Not always get it right. Because we're not. But that's not what he's rewarding. He's rewarding our diligence. David knew that there was no shame in trusting God. He had experienced it. And I think the reason we draw up our own game plan is because we don't know God's character. But David said, the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful. So you don't need an elaborate game plan for your life this year or any year. What we need is a commitment to the basics. Show me the way. Teach me the path. Lead me in your truth. It's the only way to maximize your capacity and your potential. So listen, maybe you're here this weekend and this is what you want to do, but you're, you're, you're not a, a Christ follower. Listen, it won't happen if you don't develop a relationship with Jesus. It, it, just, it just won't happen. You, you, I'm not saying you won't have some success, but you will never maximize who you were created to be. So you got to establish that relationship. So if that's you this weekend, we want to give you the opportunity to do that this weekend. Or maybe you're in the other category where you, you kind of got all these elaborate plans. You got all these things that you want to do, but you're forgetting about the basics. You haven't, you haven't reestablished those things or you, are, you haven't committed those. Things. Or maybe those things have gotten old and you need to reinvigorate them. And you need, you need to do them maybe in a different way to, to have some sort of revival. Whatever category you're in, you got to make a choice one way or the other. Because if you continue to try to do it in your own strength, it's just not going to happen. It, it, it will not happen. So my prayer for you this year is not that you're wildly successful in all of the plans that you come up with, because they might not be great plans. But I hope you're wildly successful in the, in the spiritual disciplines of seeking God. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for who you are Thank you for how you have poured your spirit out upon us. Thank you for how you presented this opportunity to help us get back to the basics, to remind us that it's just the simplicity of seeking you, the diligence of seeking you. That's what you will reward. If we're here this weekend and we haven't had the opportunity to engage in a relationship with you or accept you, God, I pray that you would speak to us. 
And God, help us to open up our hearts to you. And God, if we are a Christ following, we need a reboot and we need to establish these uh, spiritual disciplines or reestablish them or, or, or do them in a different way. God, show us the way. Show us the path and lead us in your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.